TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are. Nah, we are live. I'm tweaking. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK because you probably won't see this live. So, you know, do all of that. <clears throat> Twitch.com is where you can find any of the live streams. Usernames on the bottom of the screen. We also got Patreon where we post seven to ten times a week, including Premier League highlights, movies, and series to UK television. This is Curtis Warren, the UK Pablo Escobar. This is called Dark Sleuth S Sleuth Secrets. Is that what that say? Okay. All right. Remember, if you see your content on this reaction channel, it does not take away from your fire to light this flame. <laughs> but leave a comment and I'll take it off if you want to go. Simple as that. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. Disclaimer, this channel does not promote, encourage, or act... Okay. The plan was to smuggle cannabis into Jersey, a million pounds worth, but Warren boasted that it was just a little starter. This was the plot. Warren's contacts in Amsterdam were to supply the drugs. The gang would drive them through Belgium and France to the Normandy coast, then a speedboat would bring them to Jersey. Warren, who's from Liverpool, was the mastermind, the man with the clout and influence at the prosecution. Well, he's uh, a prolific criminal, and this Have was... Have heard of Curtis Warren? I think so. It was just the start of what we thought was going to be another build-up to more significant trafficking in the past. A million pounds worth is a lot of money, which you can then invest in other forms of drugs, buying drugs and supplying drugs. Sixteen years ago in Newcastle, he was acquitted in the lead ingot case. Massive amounts of cocaine were hidden in metal blocks. Four years later, he was convicted of a similar plot in Holland, this time the drugs hidden in concrete blocks. In a fight at a Dutch jail, Warren killed a fellow prisoner. The Sunday Times Rich List acknowledged Warren's fortune, though it attributed it to property deals. What he's been is a purveyor in, in misery for, for countless people, not just those uh, that are addicted to drugs, obviously, uh, but to those that have been victims of addicts uh, when they're trying to find the price of the, the, the next mix. He wasn't concerned with that. He was just concerned with the money uh, that he made dealing in this merchandise. Warren faces up to 14 years in prison. The islanders will be glad to see the back of him and the daily disruption to their lives. Yeah, I remember him. Okay, let's listen. You got something new on him? Imagine a scouser in a shell suit with the head of a bullet on the neck of an ox walking into Squire's Gate helipad in Blackpool casually dropping 750 pounds in crisp new cash for a flying lesson. As the helicopter lifted off, leaving behind the haze of the Mersey and the Blackpool Tower, it flew over the cold grey Irish sea toward Barrow and Furness, the heart of British submarine building. Glancing down at Holker Street, home of Barrow AFC, he simply said, I own that. His name? Curtis Warren, known as the Cocky Watchman, a man with enough swagger to match his staggering wealth. A hundred million quid at least. Once dubbed the Cali Cartel's Northern European Connection, Warren was Britain's most wanted. But Her Majesty's Customs and Excise had their own name for him. Target One. Today, Curtis Warren sits behind bars in the UK, serving extra time for failing to pay a 198 million pound confiscation order. Damn! Yeah. How y'all bust the man, freeze all his assets, then want him to pay 198 million? Of course he going to jail. His empire, built on cocaine and heroin flowing into Europe, made him one of Britain's most notorious drug lords. This is the story of how he rose to power, and why he's still paying the price. Curtis Francis Warren was born at home on May 31st, 1963. Oh, Gemini. 
Gemini gang, welcome. His father was a mixed race sailor with the Norwegian Merchant Navy, and his grandfather was listed as a coffee manufacturer in the Americas. His mother, Sylvia Chantre, came from a working class background. She was the daughter of a shipyard boiler attendant, and her mother, Baptista, originally from Bird Island, South Africa, carried a Spanish name. Warren grew up in the Granby district of Toxteth, a, a little piece of everything from everywhere. Rough part of Liverpool. It wasn't the Saint Tropez of the Northwest, then or now. The area still bears the scars of poverty and neglect, and its bomb damaged appearance serves as a reminder of the destruction from decades past. The Toxteth riots of the 1980s, combined with the area's sky high insurance rates, only solidified its grim reputation. From an early age, Warren was no stranger to crime. Attending St. Francis Xavier School, he left without qualifications, already involved in petty offenses. By 12, he had been caught stealing a car, and at 15, he was sent to a detention center for burglary. He quickly became entrenched in Toxteth's gang culture, committing small-scale thefts, shoplifting, and burglaries during his school years. Mm, but he clearly had bigger aspirations. Warren's early criminal activities set the stage for his rise in the underworld. His teenage years were spent learning the ropes of organized crime in Liverpool, gradually transitioning from petty crime to more serious offenses like armed robbery and drug trafficking. Curtis Warren, or Cocky as he was known, started his criminal career working as a bouncer, but he didn't stop there. He quickly moved up, organizing the bouncers in Liverpool. Knowing that in controlling the doors of the city's nightclubs, he also controlled the flow of drugs. I feel like it's still like this. <laughs> the bouncers be having all the... <sighs> I would tell y'all some stories, but that's, that's doing too much. Even in his teenage years, Warren had moved into selling heroin and began building key relationships in the criminal underworld. One of his early associates was Micah Hearn, who later gained fame as Warrior on the TV show Gladiators. Another was Johnny Sonny Phillips, a bouncer known for his ferocity as an enforcer. Then there was Stephen Mee, who earned his own notoriety for escaping a prison van in the middle of the Pennines. By the late 1980s, Warren had moved up in the drug world, shifting from heroin to cocaine. He formed a powerful part- Two different customers. So that is an upgrade for you people who don't know who y'all just think a drug is a drug. That's an upgrade. Allegedly partnership with another trafficker, Brian Charrington, who operated out of the northeast of England. Like Warren, Charrington was obscenely wealthy, but had no clear legal source of income, just a yacht as one does. Their ambitions grew, and soon they were taking trips to Venezuela, a stone's throw from Colombia, the epicenter of the cocaine trade. There, they brokered a deal with the Cali Cartel, one of the most powerful drug trafficking organizations in Colombia known for controlling a large portion of the global cocaine trade. The cartel operated with a business-like approach, avoiding the high-profile violence of their rivals in Medellin. Through this deal, massive amounts of cocaine were smuggled into Europe. Their method? Hiding the drugs inside steel boxes sealed within lead ingots, impossible to x-ray and difficult to detect. When customs officers grew suspicious of the shipments, they cut open one of the ingots but found nothing and let it through. Little did they know, hidden inside the steel boxes was the contraband that would cement Warren's position as one of Europe's biggest drug lords. By the time Dutch authorities figured out the truth, it was already too, too late. late. And one and a half tons of cocaine, with a street value of 250 million pounds, had been imported into Britain undetected. In January... Don't the UK got one of the... Like the... Like... Don't they consume the most booger sugar? In the world? Is it the world or Europe? In 1992, customs thought they had hit the jackpot when they stopped a second shipment using the same method and arrested Curtis Warren and Brian Charrington. It seemed like an open and shut case. They had them dead to rights. But things were not as simple as they appeared. Unknown to customs, Charrington had been working as an informant for two officers from the Northeast Regional Crime Squad. Detective Inspector Harry Nags and Detective Sergeant Ian Whedon. This raised serious questions. Was Charrington's intelligence valuable enough to justify letting him walk free from one of the- Man, if you let him walk free, you gotta let both walk free because it's gonna be more than suspicious. Biggest drug busts in British history. 
and who in this game of cat and mouse was going to come out on top. Customs pushed ahead with their case, determined to prosecute. But Nags and Whedon weren't about to let their informant go down without a fight. They reached out to Tim Devlin, a conservative MP from the Northeast and the parliamentary private secretary to the Attorney General, Sir Nicholas Lyle. Devlin arranged a meeting where the two officers pleaded their case for Charrington's release. Their efforts worked. With backing from their chief constable, Keith Hellowell, who would so they just let him go and not warn? later become the government's drug czar. The case against Charrington was torpedoed. When Charrington walked free, the case against Warren at Newcastle Crown Court in 1992 crumbled as well. Figured it has Legend to. has it that after his acquittal, Warren turned to the devastated customs officers, who were left gnashing their teeth at their failed prosecution, and said, I'm off to spend my 87 million pounds from the first shipment, and you can't touch me. <laughs> his lawyer has since denied this infamous boast, but as with no, that's diabolical if he said that. All legends, sometimes the myth is more powerful than the truth. Just a few months after the case collapsed, D.I. Harry Nags found himself under the scrutiny of customs officers at Dover. As he drove a sleek 70,000 pound BMW into the country, it wasn't the luxury of the car that raised eyebrows. It was the name on the registration. The BMW was registered to none other than Brian Charrington, the very informant Nags had fought so hard to protect. As Cur oh, man. Was it corruption? Curtis Warren's wealth and power grew. It began to unsettle the established gangs in Liverpool. Resentful of his dominance, a group of gangsters decided to teach him a lesson. Warren was kidnapped, blindfolded, and taken to a secret location where he was held for a day and brutally beaten. These same gangsters owed Warren 50,000 pounds from a previous shipment of cocaine, but refused to pay the debt. Upon his release, that was dumb. That was dumb. Like, like, take that in. A gang that owed him fifty thousand dollars previously kidnapped him, beat him, then let him go. So you owe me fifty bags, then you beat me and kidnap me to let me go. That don't sound like it's gonna work out too well. Warren sought out local enforcer Johnny Phillips. A notorious hard man with a violent reputation. Phillips was also an enemy of David Ungi, a prominent leader of a rival gang believed to be encroaching on Warren's territory. The strongest theory behind their deadly rivalry stems from a fistfight in March of that year. David Ungi, a former Golden Gloves boxing champion, fought Johnny Phillips in a street fight in front of armed factions from both sides. Ungi won the fight. Of course he did which was thought to end a dispute over a bar in Eggberth called Cheers. However, Phillips, who would later be found dead from a heart attack, was reportedly not satisfied that the matter was resolved and allegedly ordered a hit on his rival. On May 1st, 1995, just six weeks of a heart attack, was he on steroids? After the fight, David Ungi was making what would become his final journey. As he sat behind the wheel of his VW Passat, there was no indication of the violent end. This is clearly not the UK. It's giving me Chicago vibes. I ain't even gonna Waiting him. While traveling along Here's North this. Hill Street, a black Volkswagen Golf GTI suddenly cut in front of his vehicle. Ambushed by a gunman, a volley of bullets from an automatic weapon rang out. Ungi, a father of three, was struck twice as he tried to flee with a fatal bullet severing a major artery, leading to a swift death. According to Underworld reports, there is no doubt that this was an organized hit. Someone, somewhere had decided that David Ungi was going to be killed, and that was the time they were going to do it. In the aftermath of Ungi's murder, the conflict in Liverpool's criminal underworld intensified. Though Johnny Phillips was charged yeah, it's probably a power vacuum too. Charged with attempted murder in an unrelated incident on Morton Street, the case was dropped and he was never charged in connection to Ungi's death. Following Ungi's murder, the streets of Liverpool descended into chaos with a brutal rise in gang violence. The murder shook the city's underworld to its core. By May 1995... That's a part of it, man. When you're battling for the top and one of the top guys passes away, like, you always got to worry about that power vacuum. More, more violent. It's going to get more and more violent before it get better. The city saw 11 shootings in a single month, with no one ever brought to justice. The streets were ruled by ruthless gangs, and violence became the order of the day. 
One victim, Stephen Cole, a bouncer, was hacked to death by a gang wielding machetes while he sat in the Farmer's Arms pub in Fazakerly with his wife. His autopsy, which usually takes an hour and a half, dragged on for seven hours due to the severity of the attack. Sensing the heat rising in Liverpool, Curtis Warren Part made a calculated wife? move. He relocated to Holland, but not to Amsterdam. So when they do an autopsy, they gotta sew up the, mar the, the stuff too, the like, all the wounds. Where eyes were always watching. Instead, he settled in the quiet village of Sassenheim, setting up shop in a modest yet upscale villa called Bacara. The house, though spacious and surrounded by a large garden, was eerily empty, almost a symbol of how his wealth had isolated him. Warren, always on guard, rigged his attic with a punch bag and kept a close watch on his surroundings through four narrow slits in the roof, offering him a view in all directions. To pass the time, he frequently phoned his old Merseyside contacts, chatting on his mobile or porty to keep up with the latest gossip. What Warren didn't know, however, was that authorities were listening in on every conversation. But, being cocky, he made things difficult for law enforcement. He never used real names, only nicknames, adding another layer of mystery to his dealings. In his coded world, he spoke of characters like the werewolf and the vampire, Cracker, Macker, Tacker, the bell with no stalk, the egg on legs, Lunty, Badger, Boo, Twit, and Twat, Bigfoot, the Big Fella, the J Fella, the L Fella, and a host of other cryptic aliases. <laughs> the Dutch police had been hey, that's w editing. listening in on Curtis Warren's conversations, which became known as the Dutch product. The recordings revealed Warren as a masterful player in the criminal underworld, often showing a surprising subtlety. In one instance, he gently scolded the brother of a bouncer who was causing trouble displaying his ability to manage conflict without unnecessary force. These transcripts also gave a glimpse into Warren's mindset. Despite his wealth, Warren couldn't resist continuing to smuggle cocaine. It seemed the thrill of the game was more important than the fortune he'd already amassed. And that's a problem. You're gonna definitely die or be in jail for life when, when that is, when you have that type of addiction because it can never be, it can never be fulfilled. When you love the game more than the, more than the end of it, more than the conclusion, more than the pot of gold at the end, like you got to have an exit plan. His latest plan was a clever twist on his old trick of hiding cocaine in lead ingots. This time, the coke wasn't headed to Britain, but to Bulgaria, where Warren had interests in a winery. The plan was for oxyacetylene torches to cut open the lead ingots, extract the cocaine, and then dissolve it into liquid form. The genius of the operation? The liquid cocaine would be suspended inside bottles of Bulgarian red wine, ready to be shipped across Europe and smuggled back into Liverpool. Once there, the cocaine would be separated from the wine and sold at a 2,000% markup to eager buyers across the UK. That is crazy. You know how smart you gotta be to think of these different methods to get it across to where it need to be. I seen somebody do fake bananas and fake produce. It's insane. A container filled with coke-laced lead ingots made its way to Holland, but Warren had no idea his time was running out. While he slept peacefully in his villa in the Low Countries, the Dutch equivalent of the SAS launched a dramatic raid. Stun grenades explode. Let me stop you there. There is no equivalent to the SAS. Continue. Loaded, and within moments, Cocky and his entire operation were taken down, putting an end to one of his most audacious schemes yet. The Dutch authorities didn't stop with just Curtis Warren's arrest. They launched coordinated raids on six different addresses tied to his operation. At one location, they found the container filled with lead ingots and got to work with a pneumatic drill. It was a slow, painstaking process. Each ingot was about a meter cubed, and they had to drill deep into the dense metal. Finally, the pitch of the drill's wine changed, and lighter metal filings appeared, flecked with a fine white powder. Success. They had hit the cocaine. The drill hole was widened just enough for an arm to reach in, and they repeated the process ingot by ingot. And voila, hidden inside the lead was four that seems like a lot to do. Y'all don't got the technology to make that faster product process. 400 kilos of 90% pure cocaine. But that was 90? wasn't all. 
At the other locations raided by Dutch police, they uncovered an astonishing haul. 1,500 kilos of cannabis resin, 60 kilos of heroin, 50 kilos of ecstasy, nearly 1,000 CS gas canisters, crates of hand grenades, three guns, ammunition, and almost 400,000 Dutch guilders. The sheer scale of the bust was staggering. If Warren's stash had made it to market, the cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, and other goods would have been worth an estimated 125 million pounds, completely tax-free. Warren's empire was vast, but in that moment, it had all come crashing down. Curtis Warren finally faced justice, and this time, there would be no walking away. A Dutch judge handed him a 12-year sentence, which... Bro was too, um... It was way too cocky. Yeah. When you're doing illegal stuff, you gotta kind of fly under the radar. Bro was front center, cocky as ever. That's tough. For someone involved in large-scale drug trafficking, was relatively lenient compared to what he might have received in Britain. Some speculated that part of the reason for prosecuting him in the Netherlands, rather than the UK, was the potential for jury tampering. An unfortunate possibility when dealing with a criminal of Warren's stature. A well-placed threat here, a bribe or a little persuasion there, and a jury could be swayed. But in the Dutch legal system, where the case was decided by judges rather than jurors, Warren's connections couldn't help him. Despite the shorter mm. sentence, there was a sense of satisfaction among the authorities. Warren, the cocky Liverpudlian who had previously slipped through the cracks, was finally behind bars. The Dutch police, British customs, and detectives from the Northwest Regional Crime Squad, who had collaborated on the aptly named Operation Crayfish, were celebrating a hard fought. Yeah, I know y'all missed it in the chat. I tried to put it up, but Go said, uh, so that's how grenades get into the UK through the Netherlands. This is astute observation. Victory. After years Allegedly. of evading the law, Warren was finally paying the price for his drug empire. However, even in prison, Curtis Warren remained a high-profile inmate. Law enforcement officers knew that his connections to international drug cartels, particularly in South America and Europe, made him a constant figure of interest. Oh, Warren's downfall was a major win, but they also understood it might only be a temporary disruption in a much larger and more intricate drug network. While serving time at the high security... If we're being honest, it's not even a dis... It, yeah, it's a, it's a small inconvenience, but we're talking about the... What cartel? The Sinaloa cartel or whatever? Like, it's next man up for them. Security new Vosseveld prison in the Netherlands Curtis Warren found himself involved in a violent altercation. Turkish prisoner Simal Guklu, a convicted murderer, reportedly began hurling insults at Warren before launching a physical attack. Warren initially pushed Guklu away, but when the prisoner came at him again, Warren retaliated by kicking him in the head. Tragically, Guklu later died from his injuries. Warren maintained that he acted in self-defense, but Dutch authorities convicted him of manslaughter. As a result, he was sentenced to an additional four years on top of his existing sentence, further prolonging his time behind bars in the ne Netherlands. Just weeks after his release from prison in the Netherlands in 2007, Curtis Warren wasted no time getting back to business. He flew to Jersey and quickly became embroiled in a plot to smuggle one million pounds worth of cannabis into the island. I'm not gonna lie, after all of that time, you gotta stand down for a little bit there's too many eyes on you authorities who had been monitoring his movements closely See? intercepted the plan and arrested warren along with several of his associates after a three-week trial the jury found warren and his co-conspirators guilty following the verdict he was immediately flown off the island and sent to hmp belmarsh one of the uk bro just couldn't shake it he couldn't shake his love for the game it wasn't even about money no more, it's about just being involved. ...his most secure prisons, known for housing high-profile criminals. Despite the gravity of the situation, Warren chose not to return to Jersey for his sentencing. Instead, he opted to watch the proceedings via video link. True to his reputation, Warren remained unfazed throughout the hearing. As the judge handed down a 13-year prison sentence, Warren simply closed the book he had been reading for much of the trial, stood up, and walked out, escorted by prison guards. His stoic demeanor... He's probably the man in prison anyway. He probably having a good time in there. ...meaner was a stark reminder of the cool, calculated nature that had defined... And from what we know now, 
female guard, female prison guards, you know what I'm saying? They doing their thing. <laughs> they giving it up. Find his career as one of Britain's most notorious drug traffickers. This conviction not only marked another chapter in Warren's criminal history, but also set the stage for the 198 million pound confiscation order that would later extend his time behind bars. Law enforcement agencies have long been on the hunt for Curtis Warren's hidden fortune. So far, they've identified around 20 million pounds linked to his assets, though actually getting their hands on it has proven more difficult. Authorities suspect his true wealth is far greater. One customs officer involved in the investigation believes Warren may have as much as 150 million pounds tucked away, while a former associate has hinted that his fortune could be closer to 185 million pounds. Through his solicitor, Warren maintains that these claims are part of a smear campaign by Customs, insisting that he owns little more than two modest properties in Liverpool, and that the stories of his supposed multi-millionaire status have been grossly exaggerated. How much extra time is he getting for this fine? When is he scheduled to be out? Is but few already? believe him. Warren is widely regarded as one of the richest criminals in British history. With a fortune believed to be spread across tax havens, Swiss bank accounts, and luxury properties. Some reports suggest his wealth includes a posh flat in Liverpool's upscale Wapping Dock development, ironically located right across from the Customs Museum. Other assets are thought to include a fleet of luxury cars, Warren reportedly favored understated Lexuses, office blocks, and over 200 properties in the Northwest, most of which are rented out to welfare claimants. There have also been rumors of even grander investments, a mansion in the Northwest, a villa in the Netherlands, casinos in Spain, and a nightclub Bro, got it. Up in Turkey. The big question that remains is, where is all that money now? Despite years of investigation, much of Warren's wealth remains hidden, leaving authorities frustrated as they continue to track down what could be one of the largest criminal fortunes in the UK. In 2009, after Curtis Warren was convicted for attempting to smuggle one million pounds worth of cannabis into Jersey, Authorities were not just focused on his prison sentence. They were determined to recover the massive fortune they believed he had amassed from- Why? For what? So what y'all gonna do with it? I mean, I get why, but like... Y'all trying to get y'all paydays, huh? Decades of drug trafficking. Following his conviction, Warren was hit with a 198 million pound confiscation order, part of the Proceeds of Crime Act, designed to strip criminals of illicit wealth. The court gave him a set period to either pay the sum or reveal the location of his hidden assets. However, Warren, cocky as ever, said, Take me to jail. insisted that he didn't have the money and maintained that reports of his vast fortune were exaggerated. Authorities, on the other hand, believed otherwise. Investigators suspected that Warren had stashed his wealth in offshore accounts, tax havens, and hidden investments across Europe and beyond. And if he did, you ain't getting it but tracking it down proved to be a monumental challenge. By 2013, when Warren had failed to comply with the confiscation order, the court sentenced him to an additional 10 years in prison. Damn. <laughs> 10. The maximum penalty for non-payment. This extra sentence was meant to pressure him into disclosing the location of his fortune, but Warren remained tight-lipped. To date, only a small fraction of the alleged 198 million pounds has been recovered, leaving authorities frustrated in their attempts to seize the full value of his criminal empire. As Curtis Warren sits behind bars in HMP Franklin, the man once known as Cocky continues to cast a long shadow over Britain's criminal underworld. His refusal to cooperate with authorities, even as they hunt for the fortune he is believed to have hidden, only adds to the legend of the man who built one of the most extensive drug empires Europe has ever seen. Despite over a decade of investigations, raids, and confiscation orders, the full extent of Warren's wealth remains elusive, a treasure buried beneath layers of secrecy, offshore accounts, and dead ends. Well, I hired the right accountant team to get that disappeared. With a total sentence of 23 years, Warren's future seems confined to the so 23 years from 2012. Oh yeah, he still got a little nine, 10 years. Left. Walls of one of the UK's most secure prisons. But even as he serves his time, the question that continues to haunt law enforcement is simple. Where's the Where money? is all the money? The mystery of Curtis Warren's hidden millions may never be fully solved. And while his criminal reign may have ended, 
his legacy as one of Britain's most notorious and wealthiest drug kingpins lives on. And that wraps up our deep dive into the life. That's a pretty good documentary. Not even going to hold you, man. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Don't forget, follow this, follow the channel. What's the name of this channel? Oh, let me sub too, man. Hit the like button. It's called The Dark Sleuth Secrets.